good evening and welcome um, everyone. This is a fantastic um, opportunity that we have um, to listen. Oh, thank you. This one works. This one works. This one works. Uh, it's a fantastic opportunity uh, to uh, welcome some of the most prominent political economists in the world uh, today for this uh, special uh, development studies uh, department in Bloomsbury DTC for the social sciences uh, seminar session. You will have uh, with you or you have come across the seminar series. The seminars take place every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Next uh, Tuesday Stephanie Barrientos will talk about retail shift transforming work and gender in global uh, production. Uh, but the session today is both a discussion and a book launch, a launch of this fantastic resource uh, that our uh, guests have just completed. The book has just been launched and the table of contents includes 40 chapters on different aspects of alternative theories of uh, development. It's an absolutely stunning uh, book. Now, We've got some leaflets uh, here. The leaflets give you a discount if you're buying the book, and the discount is very, very substantial. So if people are interested, they could take a copy, but we do not have many copies of the leaflet, so take one if you are uh, considering it. Otherwise, you pass it along, but there will be more copies uh, later on. Now, um, the way we're going to structure the session is um, we have... Uh, Three speakers uh, this evening. Eric Reinert uh, is Professor of Technology, uh, Technology Governance and Development Strategies at Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia and is head of the Other Canon Foundation in Norway. Eric will be the first speaker and he'll speak for approximately 20 minutes introducing the main themes in uh, the book. Then Jayati Ghosh, uh, who's professor at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at Nehru University in India. Jayati will be our uh, second speaker, will speak for about 10 minutes. And Rainer Kattel, who's professor of Innovation Policy and Technology Governance at Tallinn University of Technology, uh, will speak uh, as our third speaker this evening. All three of them will speak, uh, and then I may or may not have um, comments and questions for them, and then we'll open for uh, questions from uh, the floor. Is that okay? So that's a brilliant opportunity uh, for us, and thank you so much for coming to SOAS to launch this book uh, with us. Eric. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, thank you for the nice invitation. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, We have. Yes. It's got yes. hills, yes. But we have the problem that this this one is a bit short, so I can't move it over here. And, 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 and there's a. <laughs> so. Okay. You, <laughs> that, 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 that's right. We need a labor-intensive solution with somebody holding the... <laughs> this creates employment. And it's <laughs> um, this book uh, took four years to put together, and it was an attempt to counteract new classical economics. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche is a man you don't want to mention in England, but he actually said some interesting things. One of, the, one of the things he said was that objectivity can only be achieved by looking at things from as many angles as possible. Right? If you wanted to an objective view of this building, you needed a floor plan, a photo from this side, from another side, an aerial photo. Well, this is what we tried to do. We tried to maximize the angles from which we can explain why neoclassical economics has been a failure. So, um, we have taken the historical angle, we have fought not only against the Eurocentric view, but also against the Anglocentric view. A lot of development 
literature was published in Italian, in German, in French, and in Spanish, it has completely disappeared. So we try to resurrect some of that. We have tried to cover geography, different schools, institutions, and also contemporary topics. So we start out with an int introduction, uh, and then we look at uh, two very important Italian uh, development economists. Antonio Serra is known only about seven copies ever survived of his book, but he was the one who, in who, who invented, should we say, increasing and diminishing returns. And in understanding increasing and diminishing returns for development and underdevelopment is coming up again and again, but it goes back to Serra. Botero came in 72 editions uh, in, in uh, my wife and I are trying to, to trace the best-selling economic books, the, one who made it, the ones who made it to more than 10 editions before 1850. There are 80 of them, and most of them are completely unknown today. So, so this is resurrecting kind of the proof of the pudding, you know, who, who, who was actually read and who was influential. So Botero was extremely influential. So when you find in 1622 and 23 two Englishmen, Misselden and Malines, arguing, insulting each other in seven languages, and one saying, you don't see the difference between a heap of logs and a house, so you're an idiot. He was, he was really uh, copying the arguments of Botero, that added value was manufacturing things. Right? The difference between a, a, a slab of stone and, and a statue. So. Uh, then there's a chapter on the, the on trade policy, uh, showing that f it has always been the order first emulation, copy the leader, and then comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is always coming in after you actually industrialized. Then we do the German tradition, and then there is one chapter on Friedrich List, who was a very important economist, German economist, forgotten. The, the German historical school, then we have two chapters on China, then we have a chapter on the Islamic world and capitalism, then we have the Turkish story on how Friedrich List influenced the development of Turkey. Then we have uh, development thinking in India, we have Latin American structuralism, uh, then we have two chapters on Africa, and then we have uh, the League of Nations, the Havana Charter, which was incredibly important. Uh, it was actually allowing industrial policy until countries got rich. This is Havana uh, in, 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 in the late 40s, but that has been forgotten. Then we have, that went into the UNCTAD system, and that's the next chapter. Then we have Marxist theory. Then we have evolutionary economics by Richard Nelson. We have classical development economics. We have the regulation school from France. We have another uh, Latin American chapter. We have feminist economics. Then we have three important economists, uh, Chris Freeman, Albert Hirschman, and Kaleski. Then we have the agrarian issue. We have a chapter on finance written by the man who actually penned the so-called Stiglitz report from the UN, uh, Jan Kregel. We have development planning. We have a case study of the Nordic country, competitiveness. We have the national innovation system approach. We have latecomer in industrialization, development states in the 20th century, ecology, competition, knowledge governance, legal structures, deindustrialization, and then a very interesting chapter on the link between deindustrialization and terrorism. You know, the link from unemployed males to terrorism, which, which is, uh, I think, an easy link to understand anyway. And the epilogue, uh, we take, we raise a lot of issues, uh, uh, technological retrogression. When labor gets cheaper, we will tend to have less advanced technologies. Because a business chooses technology according to the cost of capital versus the cost of labor. In Norway, we're seeing that no longer lifts are being used in construction because it's cheaper to have somebody cheap labor from Eastern Europe carrying the labor material, the material on their back up the stairs rather than installing a lift. 
So this is something I think we should be aware of, the, the technological retrogression. We have a Romanian writing about the reintroduction of feudalism in the, in, in the European Union. And we have one author, Andrea Saltelli, who's actually head of a EU think tank in Ispra, in, in Varese, and <laughs> retired, and he's writing about bad science in general. Now there, you know, we're finding cancer research, a lot of research that uh, results cannot be reproduced. So this makes me feel less lonely because economics is no longer the only bad science, right? There are also other bad sciences out there, and, and that we are discussing. So we're discussing this in a at a time of ideological shifts. And I would like, if you are gloomy about 2016, I would like to introduce another angle which, which perhaps makes it less gloomy. In the US, we found that both Trump and Sanders agree that free trade is no longer in the interest of the US. And in the beginning, they also agreed on, on uh, health care. You know, Trump... I think saw that the American, the, the American system is, is, is very expensive because of all these, all, all these insurance companies. So he said, well, look to Canada. And Sanders said, look to Scandinavia. But it was essentially the same thing. Well, Trump changed his mind. I'm not here to defend Trump. I'm, I'm saying that free trade was attacked both from the right and the left. This is the key point here. And we had Brexit. And in the old EU, EU periphery, you know, countries are seeking are sinking deeply into debt and getting poorer, Greece, Spain, Portugal, not to talk about their neighbors, not to talk about the Ukraine and Georgia, where, where, where with huge trade, de trade deficits and falling standards of living. You know, we don't know that the pensions in Russia, the Russia bordering to the Ukraine, are three times the pensions in the Ukraine. Well, there is a difference in purchasing power today, purchasing power parity there, but still. You know, and the EU used to understand that the way to stop the Russians was to make the neighbors, neighboring countries rich. We made South Korea very rich to stop communism, and it was very successful. Now we're doing exactly the opposite with the neighbors of the EU in the East. We're making them poorer, right? And uh, this is the setting. And I think we have what I call an 1848 moment. And I try to... Uh, there's a paper on that from a few years ago, but I think I'm trying to explain what I mean. The old order in 1848 collapsed because it, it was attacked from the political right and the political left at the same time. Just like Sanders and Trump attacking free trade from both sides. Um, and what collapses is a very simplistic view. I've called it the terrible simplifiers with very simplistic views, uh, like neoclassical economics, where all economic activities are seen as being alike. You know, David Ricardo making a theory based on labor hours, whether that labor hours was in washing dishes or inventing, uh, <laughs> inventing things in Silicon Valley, that didn't matter. A labor hour is a labor hour, right? And this is, I think, a key thing which brings this trade theory to, to, to a collapse. So the old elites, lose out. You see in Davos, who is the big hero in, in, in Davos now, this week? It's the Chinese. That's very logical. In the 19th century, when England was the hegemon, England was the promoter of free trade. In the 20th century, when the United States was the hegemon, the United States was the promoter of free trade. In the 21st century, when China is the beginning hegemon, well, then the Chinese will be the champions of free trade. You know, if, if you see it from that point of view, that the leaders would always be interested in free trade and the losers not, well, then we can explain why, why the Chinese are so popular in Davos this week. So, I think John Stuart Mill explained this pretty well. It often happens that the universal beliefs of one age of mankind, a belief from which no one was, nor without any extraordinary effort of genius and courage, could at the time be free, becomes to a subsequent age so palpable an absurdity that the only difficulty then is to imagine how such a thing can ever have appeared credible. It looks like one of those crude fancies of childhood in instantly corrected by a word from any grown person. This is 1848. 
how could we believe if we just got free trade between Silicon Valley and, 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 and a tribe in the Amazon or, or a raw material producing country in Africa, we would get something that the neoclassicals called you know, factor price equalization. Why didn't they see that this would lead to factor price polarization? Which is actually did, right? So I think this insight from, from John Stuart Mill is, is, is quite important. And there were three important books in 1848. Um, all recanting on Ricardo. We had Marx and Engels, Communist Manifesto. Marx, of course, he had to flee to England. Then we had Bruno Hildebrandt, who was the first of the German historical school. He's not very well known outside Germany. But Hildebrandt was such a conservative guy that he had to flee to Switzerland from Germany in, in 1951. So here you have people from both political extremes uh, attacking uh, Ricardo, right? And, and then we have, of course, John Stuart Mill, Principles of Political Economy, English liberalism itself recanting on free trade. So this is what I mean by an 1848 moment. And that's why I can be a bit optimistic. I think this is uh, the beginning of the end of, of, of neoliberalism. And I've observed it. I've been working lately in, in the Ukraine and in Georgia. And Professor Cuttle will later talk about this in Estonia, I think, that suddenly with, with Trump, to, it became impossible to, become, to be a, a libertarian, which these people were. You know, you could say, if this system doesn't even work in the core of capitalism in the US and in England, how can it ever work in Georgia and the Ukraine? Right? And this is, we actually see the results. We actually see the results. And these are the good news. <laughs> Although it may not seem good here, but I think, you know, from my friends and colleagues in, in these countries, you know, it, we actually seen the Prime Minister of Georgia move relatively fast. So I think we're facing a crisis that started in the third world in the 1970s. My wife and I lived in Peru in the late 70s, and we saw wages collapse, industry dying out. And I wondered, you know, here wages are being reduced by 50%. Why is nobody bothering? Why isn't this at least academically interesting? Nobody was interested. Then it came to the second world, a massive destruction of industry in the former Soviet bloc. Wages were cut there also by more than 50%. Agricultural production went down by 50%, industrial production down by 50%, and it created a misery. Nobody bothered. Neoclassical economics and neoliberalism survived. It was only when it hit the first world in the 2010s, with deindustrialization, falling wages, disappearing middle class, Brexit, etc., then we react. Right? So the problem has to hit the core before we react. That's why I'm very happy that it has hit the core, right? This is my argument, why I'm optimistic, because I think we can, we, we can, we can repair things. So uh, this is what happened in Russia. We lost the axis, the lower axis, which is 1992 to 2001. This is industrial production going down by more than 50%. This is agricultural production, that we didn't know. We know they stopped producing uh, industrial goods, but we didn't know they stopped producing potatoes. And this is real wages. And you see, they come down very abruptly, and then they start growing again. And here is what explains it, the exchange rate to the ruble. Right? So when the ruble finally collapsed, it was obviously overvalued in the interest of the people who wanted to get their money out of Russia, the oligarchs. And then you see, it starts climbing again. And this is also, you know, if the periphery of Europe gets rid of the euro, you will observe something like that, at least in the countries where there is some industry left to, to, to save. Right. So these are the crises the other people have had. Now we've had a similar crisis. So finishing off a bit of note on, on the US. Uh, I lived for many years in, in, in the United States. And, I'm a graduate of Harvard Business School, so I know the system from the inside. 
And, and if we, I think if we want to understand the United States, uh, uh, this was a Pulitzer Prize book in, 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 in 1964. I think it explains Trump. Isaac Asimov was a, an American intellectual, was born in Russia. There's a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there is always has been. The strain of anti-intellectualism has been a constant thread winding its way through our political and cultural life, nurtured by the false notion that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge, right? Until Trump, I never dared to show this, right? <laughs> but now I think it's, it's possible to, to, to understand that there is something there. And how can, how can the country with the best universities in the world have a cult of ignorance? Well, I can't really explain it, but... But it's very strange, and it has to do with the white thrash and, and, and all these. And there's always been a pecking order in the U.S. Uh, for a while, it was the Scandahoofians, which was the Scandinavians. That was a bad word for the Scandinavians, Scandahoofians. And then there was the Irish, and then there were others. It always had this pecking order, and, 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 and somebody has been the thrash at the bottom. And then if you combine that with another book by Mr. Hofstetter, I really recommend him, Social Darwinism in American Thought. I think if you, if you combine the, the anti-intellectualism and the social Darwinism, then Trump makes more sense, right? Or, or, or the setting, it's easier to understand the setting in a way. And also the fact that uh, American ideology was made at a time when there were always free land to, to get to the West, right? So you didn't need labor unions because if you were not happy on the west, on the east coast, well, you just moved west, west and got and got uh, free land, right? So this is the reason, <laughs> but why there was no socialism, I think. And why say people like me, like Vanna Sombat, has actually explained that in 1907. But these old theories, I think, come out and are are, are useful. So Harold Innes was a Canadian economist who I think had a very interesting view of of of, of uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, he was the, the father of the idea that the, 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 the medium is a message. This other Canadian, McMahon, got it from McMahon. Yeah. yeah, he got it from his teacher, Innes. Uh, so he says, science communicated in Latin, which means mathematics these days, gets more and more abstract and enters into alliances with the political elites. Resistance to the ruling paradigm and the elites build up among the vernacular, those who don't speak Latin, and an overthrow may take place after a shock to the system. You know, we are the ones here speaking vernacular, right, rather than, 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 than Latin, and we can make the overthrow. And he finishes with a, with a remarkable statement that Western civilization is again and again saved by knowledge that for a time only survives in the periphery. Think of those who said that it could be a financial crisis the people who supported Hyman Minsky. Well, they survived in the U University of Missouri, Kansas City, and at Bard College, upstate New York. If you, if you thought there could be a financial crisis, you had to sacrifice your academic career and go to these rather peripheral places, right? So I think this is an, a remarkable, you know, this is an argument for diversity. <laughs> the whole China chapter is also an argument for diversity, really. So, so this thought that we, we should keep we should keep strange ideas alive because in a, in a different context, they, they, they may be very valuable. So the, you have this cyclical movement of, of uh, economic theory. Physiocracy starts in 1758, peaks in the 1760s, and then the, accumul the accumulated hunger in Paris for shortage of bread because of speculation. Not because there wasn't, wasn't enough bread, but, but it was more money to be made to take wheat out of Paris to speculate for the prices to go up, right? Then, physiocracy collapses with the French Revolution. Classical economics peaks in the 1840s. It actually peaks with the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. 1847, you have a massive financial crisis in England. And in, in 1948, you have a bad harvest, not only in Ireland, but also in Europe from, from Finland to Spain. So, then you have the collapse in 1848, and in 1895 only, we see that Ricardo is really, really dead, right? And then, like Lazarus, Ricardo 
is, is reborn and creates problems again. Right? Why? Well, I think it's because that theory is easy to teach. You don't have to, you don't have to know any history. You, no. I have this theory that, that there was also demand, of course. You know, the, the elites demanded, that there was a demand for a certain kind of theory that what the elites did was good, right? So, so, so I think the demand in economic theory is really un underestimated. Uh, and, and perhaps also this idea that it's easy to, to teach. And then you get neoclassical synthesis, Samuelson, 1948, uh, and, and uh, peaks in the 1990s, especially after the fall of the Berlin Wall, you know, this triumphalism that was born after the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. I have a pile like this of newspaper clippings from the early 90s at home. The most of them are pink. And my wife says, well, why can't we throw this out? No, I'm saying this is the collection of all the crazy things that were said in the early 90s. And one day I'm going to pick them up and I'm going to write, <laughs> write about them. You know, how, how incredibly easy they thought everything was. If we just get rid of the state, you know, everything would, we'll get, we'll get uh, uh, spontaneous order. Instead, we got spontaneous chaos. So I'm, I'm closing with with uh, this, this guy, uh, Friedrich List, who was a free trader who saw the damage that free trade did in France after the Napoleonic Wars, and he understood the importance of manufacturing. Then he went to the US, his ideas, old ideas from Germany, new ideas in, in U.S. Daniel Raymond was an American economist from 1820. And here is a stamp to the left from the German, from West Germany, and to the right from East Germany, German Democratic Republic. And I dare to say that Friedrich List was the only hero they had in common. Right? So we have to remember that the Cold War was based on the same theory of industrialization. That's what united them, and that's what Carlota Perez called the isomorphism of, 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 of the left and right. right. And this is the big difference between, uh, between the, the right, political right in the 1930s, you know, uh, and the neoliberals. The neoliberals didn't have, you know, the, the political right in the 1930s and 40s actually had an industrial policy, but the political right after that didn't, right? So, so, so neo neoliberalism is the worst of all worlds. You know, they didn't, even, they didn't even understand what the, what the political right understood in the 1930s. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. And, and I think there's something there that also gives hope that this isn't necessarily a right-left thing. You can also, you can also get people, sensible people, who, who, who run a business these days and understand that, well, actually, they're, they're taking away demand. You know, by killing wages, they're removing demand. You know, if, if, uh, when I was a businessman, I wanted my customers to have purchasing power. And, and having capitalists who want, to kill, who want to kill demand, to me, is, is very strange. Right? So I think we can also get an enlightened business community to, 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 to understand this, that austerity is actually uh, an awful policy. That's what they call it in, in the late 70s. When they killed the industry in Peru, they call it el año de la austeridad the year of austerity, and that killed it. And now we're doing the same thing here, not having learned from the mistakes. Well, thank you. Jayati. Thank you very much, Alfredo, and it's always a pleasure to be back here, so thank you for having us. Look, I think Eric has done a, a great job of explaining what we were trying to do in, in this book, and I, um, in a sense, you know, what, what we were trying to do is to bring back the notion that economists always actually talked about development, that this whole notion that there's development economics, which is a different thing, and, you know, economists look at this other stuff, uh, was completely wrong. In fact, whether they were right or wrong, they actually were looking at evolutionary processes, at how economies change, at what makes them grow, and who benefits the distribution, and that these were kind of central questions that were asked a 
across the world, not just in the Anglo-Saxon tradition that, uh, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, but all over the world, in Ottoman Turkey, in, in ancient China, and, and so on and so forth. But that's particularly important today because what's happened really is that, um, as Eric was saying, that there's this whole paradigm that got developed where, where you can say, well, you know, uh, development really now is about poverty alleviation. And there is a basic framework for the macroeconomy, and that basic macroeconomic framework we know was the neoliberal framework. That's how you do everything. And then having used the neoliberal framework effectively to kill demand, you then do this, uh, shall we say, bandaging of uh, the, the cracks that have emerged in the form of poverty alleviation. This has been a very, very strong paradigmatic shift from basically the 80s onwards. And so what we're trying to do is to bring back the study of development to the concerns that basically economists should have always had. And we're trying to do it in a way, and I think many of the chapters actually bring that out, by recovering some of the lost ground that ha has occurred, if you like, in the, in the last three decades, okay? Firstly, the shift, if you like, between, you know, the micro to the macro. Uh, once you're into poverty alleviation, then you start looking at it in terms of the individual attributes of the poor. And what the poor, what features of the poor have basically contributed to, the, to their being poor. And usually these are never fundamental things like asset ownership which is like obvious, right? <laughs> That's the reason people are poor is they don't have assets, but it's more about other attributes, lack of education, da, 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 all these things, and different kinds of motivation. If you like, this has reached its apotheosis in this very trendy current thing on RCTs, right? Randomized control trials, which are trying to capture what makes people behave in a particular way, you know, using a combination of behavioral economics and the tools of epidemiological research, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the statistical likelihood of people behaving in a certain way to understand poverty and therefore also poverty alleviation techniques losing, if you like, all the systemic features. The fact that some people are poor because others are rich. And in fact, there's a very strong dependence of one on the other. And that it is made to happen in a particular way. So we're trying to bring back the emphasis on the systemic, on the macro processes, on the long run evolutionary processes that are set in train by particular policies and processes, and how these actually have evolved over time. Then there is the whole issue of what I think Eric also called it the symmetry. You know, this, this typical notion that a unit of labor power is the same everywhere. And that there's a basic symmetry between labor and capital as factors of production. That there, there are no power relations, that there's no dynamics, there's no social relations that determine what is happening between labor and capital in different spaces and in different kinds of societies and degrees of development and knowledge and so on and so forth. So we're trying to shift away from that back to the recognition that these are so social relations that matter critically. And these social relations in turn are determined by a whole range of things. So yes, there is class as an important element, but there is also gender, there are also ethnicities, there's also a particular history of that particular society that determines why certain groups have certain kinds of power and are able or not able to get the benefits of whatever growth occurs and all of those things. Essentially, therefore, you're not looking at poverty as so-called exclusion. Okay? It's not about that. It is really, poverty is very much a result of being included in that economic system. It is the way that economic system works that actually gives you who is poor and who isn't. And yes, there's a clash of class interests along with all of the other things, but uh, it is an unfolding of these processes which is really what the study of economics is about. It's not economics as it should be, let me put it that way. Whereas the notion that you can have this abstract, very simplistic abstract model, which you then apply universally wherever you go, and you will always put in the input of less state, more incentives to private capital, 
more market oriented behavior and come out supposedly with higher growth, which will then trickle down. That certainly doesn't work today, as we know, and as Eric has so beautifully ex uh, exposed, but it never worked. That no cases of successful development that we've seen have ever relied on these things and have always, always involved a significant role of the state, a significant role of the acceptance of synergies and knowledge creation, a significant role for the using of domestic energies in ways that would actually increase no, both knowledge and output. So in a sense, it's trying to, to bring back what we have lost in the study of development. And finally, of course, there's the notion that, you know, development and growth, et cetera, can just keep happening in a sense, trajectory independent of nature and of the environment. That, that's just, that the environment is just yet another cost that you can add on to all the many costs. Uh, so in a way, I think what we're trying to do, and in a, okay, one shouldn't say this about something we have, that uh, one has been associated with, but I'm really very proud of this book, and I think it's very timely, okay? <laughs> Why is it timely? Because, you know, this is, as, as Eric said, whether you want to call it an 1848 moment or whatever, it is definitely a period of transition. And we know transitions can go in any direction. They don't have to look particularly pleasant or nice. But we have it in our power to at least push for the better transitions. And to do that, we have to have at least some knowledge of what is out already out there. There is no need for us to recreate the wheel of what enables development. Because there's been a lot of historical experience and there's been a lot of damn good analysis of what it actually does. So I think this is a time when this book could actually be really useful, not just in the capitalist core, but in a whole bunch of other countries, including my own country. I think this is a time when we really can use the knowledge that has come from all these different experiences, theories, approaches, to actually make sure that this transition is a more productive, sustainable, equitable, desirable one. OK, let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Reiner. Yeah, thanks. I'll do a um, sort of like a short postscript to the two wonderful talks, or that could have been also served as a preface. And um, what, I, what I'll do is a, a sort of a brief uh, talk about, about a country and an institution, but also sort of a personal story, if you will, all three in one. Because if you look at the, um, the editors, two of the editors come from or work in one country, which is uh, not a core country and not a mainstream country at all. This is Estonia. So in, in that sense, I will, and you, you probably m might have wondering, why Estonia? Why is Estonia a place where we have a, uh, two people working there, and Giatti has also worked with us in Estonia. So why, why do we um, come up with, with a book like that? And why not London or Harvard or Daily or whatever? And uh, there is a certain reason for that. And, and the reason, actually, is in the very title of our today's event, which is about demolishing neoliberal myths. And I just actually realized when I, when I looked at the title that this is about demolishing neoliberal myths. And there is perhaps the, the most um, sort of a classic case study in, in neoliberalism is actually Estonia. So that perhaps also explains why such a book comes out of Estonia. And so I just wanted to tell you the sort of a brief history in three minutes of Estonia over the last 25 years. And also how it actually happens that actually we work there. I'm also native Estonian. Uh, and uh, why do we still work there? And, and what happened with our institution and how this book came about? So the really sort of the key uh, message about how Estonia became to be so neoliberal, neoliberal is about 1992 elections. These were the first elections after the regaining of the independence. And the election w were won, uh, for surprise of all, I think by a very young conservative party who was headed by very young people. They were below their 30s, some of them were over the 30s. Most of, most of them were actually historians out of University in Tartu. And, but sort of their main problem was that they had actually read only one book in economics, which happened to be Milton Friedman. So although they were historians and they wanted to go back into 1930s in terms of reestablishing the, the country before it was uh, occupied by the Soviet Union and Germans before that, 
So, but they didn't go back in terms of economics, because in 1930s, Estonia was, as most of these countries in this area, a sort of an industrialist, fascist type of country. And uh, so this was the only thing they didn't really go back to. And so they, they established a, a very sort of Friedmanian Thatcherite, and uh, the first prime minister was, uh, was a country, and first prime minister was very, ha very, very proud that Margaret Thatcher called him his disciple, or the main disciple. So he was very proud of that. And so Estonia became this sort of a neoliberal role model in terms of economic policy, privatization, deregulation, and all of these things. And so and up to the mid-2000s, when the, you, Estonia joined the European Union, and up to the, even to now, if you look at uh, sort of the public debt, which is the, sort of the key indicator for the European success story or not, and sort of Greece has the highest, and guess who has the lowest? So it's, um, Estonia still has this very strong poster country image of being the, the neoliberal country that works, in that sense. And, um, and, uh, and uh, you, you have a lot of growth, but I would argue there are also two interesting features that also make Estonia not only about the 1990s and 2000s, but also very much about the future ahead. And this is, first of all, it's, it is very uh, financialized economy in terms of that it has a uh, it's very high rate of exports, very high rate of uh, financialization in terms of that its banking sector is almost completely foreign-owned. So you have 96% of assets are owned by foreign banks. And so it's Scandinavian banks, so it's a completely sort of outsourced banking sector, if you will. And, th and the second thing that makes it very much about the future is, sort of coupled with the financialization of the economy, it is also very much a high-tech economy. You all have used Skype, I'm sure, but it's also not only the, in the private sector, but it's also in the pu public sector. So it's a very much a high-technology, financialized economy, which I think really makes it an interesting case for the future. And, but I'll, I'll come back to that. And so what happened in, is, is that in 2004, um, Eric and I and other people involved also in this book, we established a only and so far the only remaining heterodox department, heterodox economics department in Estonia. Uh, back then we actually weren't in economics faculty, but now we are. And we established it and, um, and I think we came in that sense very successful because in uh, around five years ago, a, back then it was a minister of economics, we had a sort of a public panel discussion and he said he wants to close us down and actually he was willing to give university a lot of money to close us down he said well if you close down these social scientists i mean i mean i mean i will actually fund your engineering departments in much higher higher degree and um, i i uh, replied to him that ministers will come and go but departments will stay and true enough uh, now we have a since two two months we have a prime minister who used to be our phd student and uh, we have a uh, First time in 25 years we have sort of a left-leaning government. It's not left government, it's left-leaning, slightly leaning towards the left. And this has shocked many in Estonia, but still. So we have a, as they say in China, if you, if you wait long enough by the river, uh, the corpse of your, of your enemy will, will float by. And this, in that sense, happened, happened to us, that um, we started from a, from a periphery and, and all of a sudden we, we became a, a mainstream. And so now I have to answer a phone call from the prime minister. And um, I think in that sense, uh, it's also perhaps a positive story that if you sort of hang out or, you know, if, if, you, if you tough it out for long enough, you actually, sort of, the time goes in cycles and so you become mainstream all of a sudden as well. And so this is how I want to come back to Estonian Gates as a sort of the future of this globalized capitalism because you have this uh, sort of a finance, I'm, I'm sure you all know the uh, book by Ilferding, uh, Rudolf Hilferding, which is the, the, the finance capital, or the das finance capital, which was written about 100 years ago, I think. And of course, he has this argument that, that, that really the, the, the financial capital is the highest form of capitalism that really dominates and organizes everything in, in capitalism. And I think that, um, and of course, it was 100, 100 years ago. If you, if you look now, you, you, you see how right he was that finance is, is such a huge force in the, in the capitalism uh, development. But I think... Estonia showed that you really have to put these days, not only is finance really important and really dominating, but it's also high tech. It's also about technology and not just manufacturing, but it's actually very much about information. And I, I don't know whether you saw that last year McKinsey came out with a report that argued that the value of data globally is higher than the value of global trading goods. And then you think about that global data is basically owned by five companies. Apple, Google, and the rest. 
But then you really start to wonder whether we are actually entering into a very different area of capitalism. And I think this is where, where Estonia becomes a really interesting case study of how the sort of the marriage of neoliberal financial and technology elite. And if you look what happened to the technology companies in the U.S. With the, in the aftermath of the, of the Trump election, they were against him before the election. They are for him after the election. So there is a sort of a dangerous alliance emerging between finance and between uh, high-tech capitalism. And again, you have to think about, for instance, that Goldman Sachs has more IT engineers, or they have their IT department is larger than Facebook com entirely. The Goldman Sachs IT departments is larger than Facebook. So think about that. And in that sense, I think Estonia is really the sort of it shows the, that how capitalism works in these globalized times. You marry their finance and ICT. But with the new prime minister and our help, I hope uh, perhaps Estonia is also the the way ahead. It shows that. The way you can actually manage the, the globalized financial information capitalism is to have a left-leaning government that actually looks after the poor and invest in infrastructure and industry and, and things like that. So I hope this will be the dream, and I hope this our book also helps in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reiner. Thank you very much. So uh, we're going to have a conversation about the topics that have been raised in this uh, set of presentations. Um, let me start with uh, two questions, two comments for, for all panelists, but you don't have to answer now. I mean, you, you can say something now if you want to, or you can just wait for additional questions from uh, the floor. Just two issues. One is, uh, Eric mentions the... No, sorry, before I say that, I, th I think the... Um, Focus on the systemic, the focus on the historical dimension, and the focus on social relations uh, in the book. These are absolutely central, and this is uh, very, very uh, similar. This is identical uh, to what we try to do at SOAS when we study development too. And I, this is absolutely central for a balance, for uh, for a balanced understanding of development for an attempt to understand the dynamics of development or the sources of dynamics in processes of development. Now, so that's fabulous. Two comments or, or questions on uh, what was uh, mentioned uh, by Eric um, uh, tonight. What is the notion of the 1848 moment? I thought that was very, very nice, very provocative, really nice. The uh, attack on the establishment from left and right, the center cannot hold. It wasn't clear to me, though, if the what, what is the center? Is the center Ricardo and comparative advantage theory, or is the center neoliberalism? And how? what is the relationship between these two um, options? And the second is, you attempted, from, if I understood it correctly, to look at Trump in the context of the collapse of neoliberal ideology and the, and the actual decay of neoliberalism. But what is it that is decaying within neoliberalism? Because uh, you mentioned some alternatives there, and I'd, I'd, want, I'd like to understand kind of the, the, the relationship between them. Is it the industrialization that is the problem? Uh, but if there is the industrialization somewhere, normally there's industrial manufacturing growth somewhere else. Uh, so is the problem low wages and lack of aggregate demand? Or is the problem something that I don't think you emphasize very much, financialization? What are these things? What role do these elements play in the um, collapse of neoliberalism and then the collapse of neoliberal ideology uh, on top of that? So that's just very briefly these two points. Would you like to say something about that or shall we move on to... Oh, perhaps, I should say, uh, perhaps I should say something. I mean, there's a limit to what you can say in, in, in 20 minutes and what's in 850 pages. But... Uh, if we want to complicate the issue, there was another 19, 1848 moment, uh, which was around 1932, uh, when Keynes wrote an article saying that I was brought up to believe that, that uh, free trade and comparative advantage was part of natural law, and now I understand, now I understand that, I was, uh, that I was wrong. It's a, it's a little paper called National Self-Sufficiency. Uh, and, and, and that's a wonderful paper. And then I got very scared because I found that there were 84 years between 1848 and 1932 and between 1932 and 2016. And I said, no, <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to believe that. 
But fortunately, I discovered I was wrong. Keynes article was 1933. So, <laughs> so we don't have to be superstitious about these things. But, but there, there is a, a generational argument, which I think what comes out of, 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 of Reiner, uh, what Reiner said. And that's back to Keynes again writing to General Smoot sometime, saying that, you know, when the world has gone bananas, the world is mad, there's only one thing that works, which is relentless truth, relentless truth telling that will work in the end, right? And, and this is where I feel that we have tried to do some relentless truth telling for a while, and suddenly the new prime minister in Estonia, as of two months ago, is our PhD student, and he calls Reiner for advice, right? That's, that's when the relentless truth-telling has worked, right? And it, it is a generational thing, right? Because, unfortunately, too, f you know, too few people change their mind you know, along their career. And that, that's the beauty of, that was the beauty of Keynes, I think. So, so yes, financialization is there. Industrialization, there is... Ungtad used to talk about symmetrical dependency, which was good, and asymmetrical dependency was, was bad. And I also think there is natural, you know, William Petty, 1680s or something, wrote, uh, after seeing Holland, he formulated Petty's law. And Petty's law is that first there is agriculture, then industry will, 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 will grow, and then you get services growing. You know, how you could see that in the 1680s? He looked at Holland. But that's what happens, of course, also because there's so much productivity increase in industry that, that, that it shrinks, you know, but, you know, the heart is only half a kilo, it's a, it's a small percentage of the body, but it's still important, right? And it's, it, the industry is a bit like that. So the problem is premature deindustrialization, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and the two last chapters, I think, is really worth looking at because they, they talk about this pr premature industrialization. The, the mature one is, is like Holland today, <laughs> right? Uh, so and the problems of financialization, absolutely. You know, the the the. Uh, I was fortunate to be brought up by people who had studied. Uh, uh, my teachers had studied. Some of them had studied in the thirties, and 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 I had Moses Abramovich of Stanford. You know, I was writing my things, and well, of course, what you're saying, we we all knew that in the nineteen thirties, right? So so it it struck me, and you mentioned Hilferding, right? Hilferding was this wonderful Austrian. Uh, you know, he, he was a, he was a, a, a Jew who was killed by Gestapo, but he was the one who really made the theory of how awful, awful uh, the stage of financial capital would be. But they all got it from Hobson, the, the Englishman. You know, Lenin learned from Hobson that that when the financial sector takes over, that will be the last stage of, of capitalism. And I think I think Lenin was true, but he got it from this guy. Hobson, right? So, so these, the interesting thing is that the ideas go back and forth, right? They go back and forth politically, but, but, but uh, uh, as they, they said in the movie Casablanca, you know, the, the fundamental things apply as time goes by, and, and this is what we're trying to get at, you know, the, these fundamental things which pop up in Lenin and this Englishman Hobson from somewhere and, and all over. So, and the finance is, is, is in there. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. Questions, comments, um, ideas, contributions um, from bold um, people in the audience? Yash, would you like to? Maybe afterwards. Okay. Uh, Yash is one of the contributors uh, to the book. Um, yes. Shall we try and collect a few yep. questions before we... Yes.
systemic approach or a nature of global capitalism and the tendencies of foreign periphery. But what, I would love to hear your thoughts on the power of individual countries to withstand the pressures, the credit pressures of the system, and how do you envision collective change to the global system? Thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. Any more questions for this round? Okay. Uh, yes, do one more and the, uh, I'll ask the authors. <laughs> Thanks very much. Would the editors like to comment, and then we can have, a, can have another round of uh, questions. Um, in well, I was responsible for the chapter on deindustrialization or, or choosing the person. Um, George de Lugian, who wrote that chapter, is an Armenian who had tenure in Chicago. No, in not the University of Illinois, no, University of Illinois, Northwestern, and he knows all these countries, the stunts, extremely well, and he's he's written on that, and he's a bestseller in 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 in, in the region, and his argument is is essentially that it's it's more Chechnya, right? That how. Can you explain uh, this uh, sudden rise of terrorism, quote unquote? And he explains it by the loss of industry, and we we also have another person here. I think uh, Jayati is is or used to be in a. Indian Commission trying to explain the high number of suicide among uh, uh, among Indian farmers and Jayate we had a and, and, and Yash we had a conference in 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 in, uh, in, in Uganda where you brought in uh, uh, an author from Nigeria who talked about violence coming from males who had lost their prestige right Remember that that made a tremendous impression. That 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 actually uh, the the fact that you've lived in an industrial society for generations, like the the people had in the Soviet Union, and then they lose their jobs and they lose their prestige. And this, I think, is what Georgi explains in that chapter, you know, exceedingly well. I think it's. I think it is a convincing argument. It goes back to the argument that 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 unemployed men is the. If, if you look at 
in revolutions in Africa, you know, the main ingredient is unemployed males, right? So, 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 so there is something here, um, and 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 the, so I think it's 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 a profound thing. You know, this is not this is not anti-Islam. You know, if we talk about religion, I would say that that you know, Baghdad in the year 800. Uh, is we owe civilization to Baghdad in the year 800 because they translated all the texts from classical texts from Greek into Ar Arabic, and then only 500 years later we translate them from Arabic into Latin, right? So, so it, you know, don't misunderstand me. It's no, no, no. Yeah. Well, uh, before I give the word to uh, to Jai, the, the the person who jo uh, wrote the chapter on on Muslim economics uh, used to be the head of the UN, the chief economist of the UN office in Beirut. Uh, so, so we tried to to delve into that, and to some extent, from what I say about Africa, I think there is, the, the, to some extent, it can be generalized. But, 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 uh, and. and I think what, what we try to say in the book, religion and, econo and economic growth, Torn, uh, Richard Tony, an, an English economist in the 1920s, said, said that don't talk about economics, development, and religion. It's caused by less, less religion, regardless of what religion. It was less, <laughs> it was less Catholicism and it was less, Mus <laughs> it was less Muslim, right? So, so I think the, 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 it's, a, it's a very complicated argument, but... but has something to add. Yeah, no, I, I want to come in on, it's working, right? You can hear me. I want to come in on it because, you know, it's actually quite a sophisticated argument. It's not just jobless males equals violence, okay? What he's really saying is that the collapse of the Soviet era developmentalism actually brought back feudalism. And it brought back networks of patronage. If you will excuse me, I'm going to just read a few lines because I think it's a very interesting and unusual argument. The disintegration of Soviet de developmentalist dictatorship created violent, violently chaotic, yet strictly bounded patterns of private patronage based on the ongoing redistribution of rents. Ethnicity, or even more narrowly, clan-supplied social connections and ideological legitimation to those inherently exclusionary practices of micropower. But the restrictive and exclusionary logic of patronage was now generating tensions within the ethnic communities themselves. So what you're getting is, yes, there's an overall collapse of employment. There is a collapse of that whole structure of accumulation, which involves some industrialization, which is now no longer there, available. So it's not just the absence of jobs. It is the emergence of new jobs within these very clientelist patronage networks, ethnic-based, which then in turn cannot deliver beyond a point. And because they are exclusionary, the elite is screaming it all off, and you are then at the bottom of it, dependent on them, but angry and frustrated and so on and so forth. And then he has more things about how religion then plays into this. So it's not that all fundamentalists are necessarily violent, uh, but that a certain kind of fundamentalism is then drawn upon. As, as an avenue or an outlet for this kind of exercise in frustration, if you like. So it's a more sophisticated, it's, it's a very sophisticated argument. So I, I do recommend you read it. The e-book, it's affordable. <laughs> but, but I also just wanted to take up the question about free trade, which I think is a, is a very profound question. I mean, what, what on earth is it? And um, it, I mean, in a sense, and which Eric has shown very, very effectively in his uh, book, an earlier book, why rich country, how rich countries got rich and why poor countries stay poor, which is an absolute classic, uh, he, that basically you, you, you support free trade when you're in the position of power that will benefit from it. And you, uh, all countries have actually not supported free trade, free trade in terms of, you know, 
relatively barrier free exchange of cross border exchange of commodities they have not supported it when they were in a position not to benefit from the economies of scale involved and so on and so forth so it's only when you have reached a sufficient size and power that you would actually uh, engage in free trade before that in fact as as we colonies all know to our cost trade came with the barrel of the gun right it came with the ships and the armies and the police and we were forced to trade in ways that didn't benefit us but i think the the globalization of today is again not a free trade globe i mean it's it's a destruction of free trade only to some extent and i think what's worth bearing in mind is that what we've seen in the very recent past especially with the trade agreements not just the multilateral but the plurilateral and so on is that you have a lot of so called free trade in the production part the production phase of things which is where we're all competing with each other to bring down and you know the the sort of race to the bottom and so on and increasing concentration and lack of so called free exchange in the pre production and the post production okay pre production meaning design and you know all the things that apple supposedly does not just apple but benetton and zara and everything and post production which is the marketing and branding that's where all the reds are concentrated that's where there is a lot of concentration that's where power dominates and where market so called is completely non existent because you're completely dependent on intellectual property rights which are highly monopolizing so the free trade part is only for the production it's not for the pre and post production phases a very yeah. Yeah, just to just comment on the same sort of trade issues if you you know if you look at WTO agreements what is left out of it is R&D so you can do in R&D whatever you want and you can support it how much you want so you can you know you can do everything about and also what is left out of WTO agreements is of course information data is not part data is not regulated under trade agreements so essentially there is no limits and it's also almost impossible to to limit data so that's why of course um whatever trump or others might do in terms of uh, tariffs it's hardly going to make a big difference as i said because pr production is um uh is probably quite uh, quite difficult even to put tariffs up because you can go to the uh, WTO arbitrage and all this and it's going to be very messy but of course as i said money is not made anyway in, in production and i think the um um the second thing about you asked about countries sort of sustaining or withstanding the pressure of neoliberalism that is still out there and i think indeed the european union of course is a, is a very sort of a sorry example of that in terms of uh, greece and other countries that are still are are um, in you know finding it very very difficult even if they have governments that are not imbued by the neoliberal ideas it's very difficult for a cyprus government to do much different than the any other previous government and so there is an in a way there is a hope for what what you call fashion because fashion is that you know everybody wants to be fashionable hardly any anybody wants to be uncool and even if you and that's why i think i think where, where eric's optimism comes from that you know if if a lot of too many people are saying that actually this kind of european union is not that cool actually anymore and if 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 you know and in london you can see it by the success of mariana mazzucato's book i mean because it is it's a very sort of a non free trade book it's a very statist book and it's and it has been incredibly successful so there is obviously a sort of a fashionable tide rising that argues differently and i i think for um, you know people increased it just may may not be soon enough and that's where the the critical issue comes whether you can actually sort of actually sort of accelerate this process of fashion that fashion changes and and here i think as you as you mentioned the journalism plays a huge role because most people don't create books but they read well they read tweets but you know <laughs> Eric wanted to just very briefly the original definition of free trade was the absence of prohibition it was not the absence of tariffs right so 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 you know the, the meaning of the word has been completely changed and and i'm all for free trade if it means absence of prohibition but not not but it but it means absence of tariffs that's great thank you uh we can have another round of questions uh yeah well, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Uh, <coughs> well, I come from Uganda. Um, no, just to mention that Yash has contributed uh, or is the author of Chapter 13, Development as the Struggle for Liberation from Hegemonic Structures of Domination and Control. Now, I want this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'll be brief. I'll try to be brief. <coughs> I'm, uh, I'm from Uganda. I'm one of two authors in the book from Africa. <coughs> And I basically argue that development is a, all development is resistance, all development is resistance. I learned this in Zimbabwe, where I stayed for 23 years in exile from Uganda. And I learned this from working in rural areas. My wife and I were sitting there. We are not academics, we are activists. We work for 23 years in rural areas and we learned from women. In a patriarchal society, women were marginalized and yet it were the women who were providing for the families by growing grains that were sustainable, not or organic grains, not seeds, imported from outside. But women were harassed, oppressed by the men. And we learned that women decided that the only way to do is to resist patriarchy, but also the national state system that patronizes the men. All, all development is resistance. How many of you here believe in empire? Raise your hands. Is there something called empire? Wow. Six hands. In a group of what? About 50, 60 people. Empire. If you do not understand empire, you understand nothing. Eighteen forty eight was not the critical date for us in Africa. The last two, forty eight should be reversed to eighty four. Eighteen eighty four was the date for us in Africa. And in Berlin they set a map of Africa that it just divided us up. Not eighteen forty eight. Not Ricardo. No. Berlin. And the devastation of Africa by Europe. Empire still exists. That's the basis of my paper. Eric raised the question about ignorance and knowledge. Your knowledge is equal to my ignorance or your ignorance is my knowledge. It's a very deep epistemological question. Where does knowledge come from? Where does knowledge come from? I am now in retired in Oxford and I <clears throat> went to launch my book once. And my book is called Trade is War. Trade is War. There has never ever been free trade. Never. Ever. Even during the time of the mercantile period of the British, of the English, it was not a free trade. Never, ever. Free trade is a total myth. By the way, economics is a total myth. <laughs> it's nothing about economics. Economics as a subject is a total abstraction. It doesn't exist. I was taught economics at the London School of Economics. I was student there in 1958. How many were you there in 1958? <laughs> Some of you. I learned economics till Keynes was pouring out of my two years. I knew general theory very well. I went to my supervisor and said, 
Professor, I don't want to do economics. He says, why not? I said, whatever I'm learning, learning here is not applicable to my country in Uganda. He said, why? I said, the whole thing is determined by the empire in Uganda. We were not independent at that time, 1958. There is no supply and demand. There is no fit. There is no market. Everything I'm learning is total nonsense. Britain dictates all the policies. He says, do you want to get your degree or not? I said, yes, sir. He says, read and give them what you want. And then he, I got very good grades, by the way, in the end. <laughs> so the professor said, why don't you stay and do PhD? I said, thank you, but no thank you. Not in economics. It's a total myth. For three years, I've, I've learned something. This is a devastating. Keynes, Keynes was an ideologist of the empire. Read his book. Ideologist of the empire. So I said, no. I'll do international relations because I think that's geopolitics. That's Anyway, epistemology. Where does knowledge come from? I lectured the other day. No, I attended a seminar in Oxford. And the person who wrote the thesis, she, uh, she, she did a PhD on the ethnic factor in Kenya. There was discussion, and I, said, I kept silent for a whole period. I said, what's happening? At the end, I raised my, question, my hand, and I said, may I say two things? I said, one thing is that if you put in your title the ethnic factor, as your thesis title, you're going to prove it, that the ethnic, the ethnicity is a factor. And that's what she had all the algorithms to prove that ethnicity is the factor in Kenya. I said, no, there are many other factors in Kenya. But that's not my main point. My main point is that you have 50, 60 citation references, maybe 70 references. Hey, why is not, not there a single African mentioned? Not one African author? Not one. All knowledge comes from Eurocentric sources. All. And that's the third point. I have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> all knowledge except the social sciences. In social, all, all hard sciences come from experiments. and That's why. All social, social science knowledge comes from experience. Always social science. All, all this is all from experience. And that experience is turned into books. And books, they give derivative knowledge. You know the concept of derivatives in finance capital? Where in fact, the, the share stocks fly, fly up in the air with no asset base. Just, they are derived. Speculative. All social sciences are speculative. Real social sciences come from experience. Therefore, in 19... 72, when I was thrown out of Uganda at the mercy of the British, because the British staged a coup in my country and threw out Obote, and we Asians found ourselves outside. And I came in and started teaching at London School of Economics in 73. I resigned from 70, the, my post, and I went back to Africa, to Tanzania. I, I taught in Tanzania at the Islam University, but I was underground. My book has a small piece there of how we joined the underground movement to fight against the means dictatorship, which dictatorship was put in power by the British. And we fought for nine years underground. I was part of the guerrilla movement. I'm a guerrilla. Was. Non-violent. I didn't hold a gun, though. The point is, all knowledge is experiential in social sciences. All knowledge experience. Nothing from books. Books are purely derivative. And therefore, this book contains two authors from Africa, but we haven't yet told our story. Africans have not told their story. Yes. Okay. If you don't tell your story, somebody Stop. else writes the story for you. I'm afraid I, I just, uh, I, can, I get emotional because knowledge is not cyclical. It's dialectical. 
development is dialectical. And all development is a resistance, and we are still fighting in Africa because all theories are Eurocentric, and Africans have not told their stories despite the two pieces there are in this book. Gosh, that's fantastic. Um, but comments, questions, um, ideas, suggestions. We have time for a second round. Yes. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Any additional points, comments? Yes. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. Uh, yes, that's the final comment. Um, fantastic exercise in excavating the diversity of opinions from which some form of objectivity can emerge. I'm delighted that there's at least one reference to um, the logical perspective, the environmental perspective. But of course, but by, by definition of the historical exercise that you've engaged in, um, few of the development perspectives will be dealing with the kind of issues to do with planetary boundaries that we're dealing with now. And even just in some of the references and the opening remarks, the, um, the default position um, in, in terms of the challenges to development and dealing with poverty is all about um, reversing austerity, driving demand, etc., etc., etc. It seems to me that there's perhaps a complementary exercise to one that you've engaged in, which can deliver or elaborate a diversity of views that can even begin to square the equation of how we may all thrive within planetary boundaries. It, with, you know, Trump may, for counterintuitive reasons, bring about optimism in terms of uh, a political dialectical conversation. In another sense, in the pocket of the fossil fuel industries, as we sit on the barrier, dancing on the cusp of irreversible climate change, um, I wonder how quickly we can engage in the exercise of putting development theory and practice in the context of planetary boundaries. Thank you. Thanks very much. So, um, the editors, in whatever order you wish to. Okay. Oh. <laughs> we just we have to move the mic. Okay. okay, perhaps last things first. Um, I hinted at this that Antonio Serra, 1613 writing in a jail in Naples, in a sense gives us a tool to where we can be, well, I didn't, this is elaborating on that, gave us a tool to where we can be optimistic and where we can be pessimistic, right? Um, and John Matthews, who is one of the authors, and I wrote a different a paper in the Futures, where we actually argued that in, 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 in some sense, you know, the, the problem is Malthus in, Malthus out, right? And, and limits to growth was very useful, uh, but there are certain things, if you, if you move from diminishing returns of extraction of energy to increasing returns of harvesting energy, you can actually be optimistic. You know, it, you, you can, you know if we harvest the wind and if we harvest the sunlight, you know, we don't get any less wind or less sunlight, right? 
So, so we can, there, there are areas when we can be optimistic. And I, I looked at the call of a, the cost of a transatlantic phone call in the early 1930s, and it was like five years for a normal industrial worker in England now to talk three minutes across the Atlantic. Well, if we now, thanks to the Soviet Institute of Cybernetics in Tallinn and a Danish and a Finnish entrepreneur with Skype, we can now do this free with video across the Atlantic, right? So what was five years of salary is now free. So we also, so what does that mean? Does that mean, it means that GDP, what we count as GDP is, 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 is very often not relevant. It, 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 and it means that in terms of phone calls, you know, we're not ruining the world by, by uh, um, speaking on Skype. Uh, so it's also kind of a Schumpeterian creative destruction kind of thing. But is it degrowth? Since we don't <laughs> since we can't measure it, is it is it degrowth? <laughs> because it's hardly it, 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 hardly possible to, to to measure. Well, I think this is. Uh, this kind of approach, which actually we go back to this guy Serra and say he is the one who, but still, you know, a, a golden ring will probably cost four tons of toxic waste. Still, right? <laughs> but, but but we have to be a bit selective of 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 what we, you know, we, we should kill fossil energy. But we, it was like London and New York, 1880s, horse manure was a big problem and and dead horses, right? So there were three options. Put pampers on the horses, that's cleaning for CO2. That's putting pampers on the horses. Or moving back to the countryside, <laughs> which two authors of Limits to Growth did. Or we could invent the car, which 100 years down the road created another problem. Right? So, so I think we, we, we should be more selective uh, 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 where, we can be, where we can be slightly optimistic. And, and tax golden rings, but not necessarily Skype f f phone calls. So, so I think that's that's, that's an uh, would be my view on it. And the options. Karl Polanyi, 1944, The Great Transformation, is a wonderful book. It I would recommend it. This is the best of anthropology and the best of you know how to understand how things were before capitalism. The first 99 percent of human activity. And Polanyi says, well, there were really three movements against um, laissez-faire. It was communism, it was fascism, and it was Roosevelt's New Deal. Right? And, and, and I think those are still the th three kinds of options we have. The three kinds of options. And, 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 and you know, out of the craziness of the United States, where, 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 the, where we see that Trump is is going to want uh, to set the rules. They're going to determine free trade when, when, when they want it or not. That's not, you know, we, we need order. We need the Havana Charter again, right? So, but these are still the options. So I'm, I'm for the Rooseveltian uh, solution. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, th that's why I can be optimistic. Maybe that will be violent, I don't know. Uh, but there's certain things, certain forgotten people like Mariner Eccles, who was the head of the Federal Reserve from 1934 to 1948. I mean, he did a wonderful job, and nobody's ever heard of him. So we're trying to resurrect him. Sorry. Hmm? I'm trying to remember the question. <laughs> I didn't write them down. Um... Well, on, on the development, I think the rule here is that development, economic development is activity-specific. You know, during the first Industrial Revolution, if you were in cotton spinning, you had economic development. That was the only place where there was technical change, right? So, so the windows of opportunity for economic development, they move. They move to where there is always imperfect technological change, imperfect markets, new knowledge, etc., etc. So in a sense, it's a moving target. And, and I would recommend Carlota Perez, a book on techno-economic paradigms. Who, who, she's very good at, at at explaining the dynamics of this. 
So, so the, re the formula for economic development in the, in the 20th century was very different from what it is now. But, but what stays the same is, the, is that it's activity specific. It's in some, some economic activities and not in others. That's what's, uh, what, what's always the same and always repeats. And the question then is, well, what's, which one is going to be the next? And, 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 and we don't know that, fortunately. Uh, and and, and uh, you know, we, 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 in, in the 1880s, it was, it was the steam car, it was the electrical car. We had electric trams, and then you had this f outsider from Germany, Mr. Benz, who nobody's heard of, who, who actually invents the thing. So the interesting thing is that these technical changes come as surprises from the outside. Right? This, this is... Uh, this is and, and the, the 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 microchip was the same thing. What should we do with this? Oh, hearing aids. Maybe this is something new for hearing aids, right? And then it revolutionizes the whole the whole society. So it's uh, you know we can see patterns, but not not solutions other than than this activity specific thing. Yeah, I have just I think Andrew, you're on to a a big thing, and you're right that there is scope for a parallel volume or many volumes looking at looking at this issue. But I think one of the things that comes out from this volume, anyway, is that uh, looking at looking at uh, material progress, even in terms of you know simple-minded expansion of GDP, is all wrong. So yes, it's activist, it's activity specific, but then how those activities contribute to human welfare and in different ways and how they add to the knowledge that generates energies and, and so on varies, okay? So, uh, I mean, as, as Eric was saying, the technological change that occurs over history varies in terms of its implications, right? There are the good stuff, there's the good stuff and the bad stuff and the destructive stuff and the creative, productive stuff. Uh, so I think one of the things that comes out of this would be that as long as you're simply obsessed with the standard GDP growth expansion, then boy, are you going to hit the planet. In fact, we've already hit it and it may well destroy us. Uh, but if you move beyond that to a broader notion of what material and human progress is, and then you're not so dependent on this and you don't necessarily have to go for those mistakes in a way. But but I, I take your point that it's it's a much bigger issue that needs to be delved into, you know, in many different kinds of ways as well. Um, the, this brings me to the other question about you know policies and and if you like the context specificity of policies. And I think that there's no question. I mean that that if there's one lesson from here, yes, everything is context: social, historical, cultural, political, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's no way you would have one set of policies that determines everything. But again, an underlying lesson, which I, Eric just stated again, is what you do matters. And, and don't let people kid you that, oh, you don't need to do this, especially when they have done it and are where they are because they did it. So what the people in that society do and the conditions under which they do it matter crucially. So the policies have to be driven by recognizing what they are doing and why, and the, hist the history and politics that have made them do that, and then see how you can get them to be doing the things that would actually be benefiting them more, okay? And so, in a sense, the policies would be context-specific, but directed around that set of questions, rather than, you know, again, you know, okay, just go for GDP, which means, okay, you liberalize finance, you get a big expansion of the financial sector, you have a big explosion of GDP, and you're feeling good about it. I, I think it would be, context is everything, but context is everything around a different set of questions. Whether you have been a colony, or whether you are post-industrial uh, Soviet, ex-Soviet economy that has been completely deindustrialized, or your economy like India, which uh, well, it's a mess for many different other reasons, and so on. It will determine absolutely what you are going to say about the policies there. So I guess that's the not very useful answer. <laughs> yeah, just to <clears throat> just to finish off, I think, the, uh, in spite of the, or despite this book being very strongly historically oriented, I think in terms of policy, I think we really need a real policy innovations. I, I think we need them in sort of three areas. First of all, it has to do with ownership. I mean, who owns my data, I think, will be the question for the 
next decade in that sense to, to decide who really owns my data, how can I earn any money on it? And, and I think that's really fundamental both for developing and for developed countries. And the second thing is actually who pays my wages, who pays my wages? I mean, even especially if I'm in sort of a sharing economy, Uber driver, I mean, who's going to pay my wages if you have essentially no floors anymore on wages, if you have no unions and anything like that? So is the basic income the, the answer to that? Or can we afford that? How can we afford it? So I think there's these kind of questions actually need to be answered both in Africa, but also in, in London. And third, I think, is, um, is how do you protect infant industry against Amazon? How do you protect industry against Airbnb? And it's the same again in London or in, in Africa. It's the same question. How do you protect something that is incredibly intangible? You cannot track it. And, and funny enough, I think uh, perhaps the best answer was given by Schumpeter in his book, Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy. He would probably say that, well, nationalize it. Just make it infrastructure. Amazon, Uber, all of them nationalize. That's probably the best way for capitalism to, to survive. And so that's something like, uh, I think something like that is what I think the European left especially is really grappling with and to, to come up with sort of ideas, what do you do next? And that's why you see the problems of, uh, of Tsipras government, for instance, increase because just, they just don't have ideas to how do you fundamentally challenge the situation you're in. And I think that's also for, for people like us, for people like you to really think about how you actually really are innovative in terms of policies, not only in terms of knowledge and ideas, but also really in terms of policies. Thanks. Thank you um, so much to um, our um, editors that have come to SARS to launch the book, Eric uh, Jayati Reinert. You can totally expect to see several chapters of this book making their way into reading lists from now on, and this will be fantastic for our teaching, but also for education more generally. There's a, an enormous amount of reflection and careful thought in this book. Now. Um, we will have, uh, as usual, our post-seminar reception in the staff common room in the main building of SOAS. You're all invited to come with us next week. As I had mentioned, Stephanie Barrientos will speak about uh, retail shift, transforming work and gender in global uh, production. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you very, very much to our editors. <laughs>